Greetings cousins near and far, and welcome to my channel Ancestral Spotlight. Today we're going to talk about the controversial topic of lowering centimorgan and SNP ranges. What happens when we lower the centimorgans and SNPs when comparing DNA kits? Well, the simple answer is a lot of things. There is so much to unpack when we discuss lowering centimorgans and SNPs and you should use caution and be reserved when utilizing these features in your own research until you have a firm understanding of how and when to use them. They can be as damaging as they can be helpful to your research project, so you really need to understand what is happening when you venture away from the default settings. To get the most out of this video, you're going to want to be familiar with some of the terminology and concepts explained in a few of my other videos. I'll provide links to each video series in the description box below. Definitely check them out, they will help you understand this video better. Let's consider the purpose when comparing DNA kits between two people. In this diagram, we have two people, person A and person B, and we want to prove they share an apex ancestor, also known as a most recent common ancestor. We look for the shared centimorgans between the two people. Now, on the genealogy websites, when we look at a DNA match, it's important to know that the companies have set a standard default centimorgan threshold for all your matches to be filtered through. What does this mean? The standard centimorgan threshold is between 5 and 7 centimorgans, depending on the company. Imagine a microscope. The closer we zoom in on a specimen, the more detail we see. In the case of DNA, we can see really far back in time when we zoom in really close. So when you're trying to confirm a fourth or fifth great grandparent, comparing DNA connections from hundreds and thousands of years ago is not going to be very helpful. Because yes folks, autosomal DNA comes to us in little random snippets from all our ancestors that came before us, back to the dawn of our species. The closer we look at it, the further back in time we see. And there is a lot to unpack there, like random inheritance and recombination. I have videos on both of these topics, so find the links in the description box below. So, these standard default settings of 5 to 7 centimorgans allow us to view DNA matches that sit between the 5th and 7th great grandparents approximately. Do these standard centimorgan thresholds go further back in time? Absolutely. There are so many variables to DNA that we do not yet understand, and it's important to know that genetic genealogy is constantly evolving. Genetic genealogy is a fairly new field, and we are truly in the infancy of this science. With that said, these defaults provide an automatic cutoff, so the average consumer is not overwhelmed with DNA matches that otherwise connect many generations beyond the research they've done. To those who are advanced, and have extensive family trees that go back many generations, this is a major disadvantage. A prime example is my Donna Schwaben ancestry along my maternal branch. The Donna Schwaben were subject to a genocide campaign, not dissimilar to Jewish and indigenous American people. We also have many countries and communities that frown upon DNA testing. So for me hoping to find a genetic connection to my Donna Schwaben relatives after consecutive generations of a sole generational descendant stemming from a decimated population, the connections will be distant, averaging four to six centimorgans. I had cousins show up on Ancestry prior to the minimal centimorgan threshold change, and now they no longer appear as matches. This was a major setback. Now at the standard five to seven centimorgan default, we count up the total of shared centimorgans at the default range, and with the assistance of tools, such as the Shared Centimorgan Project, we can get a good idea of how a person may be related to us. Notice how the average number of shared centimorgans can be a possible fit for many relationships. The lower the shared centimorgan at the default setting, the harder it is to confirm the relationship between two people. This is where additional tools come into play, namely chromosome mapping, also known as chromosome painting. Chromosome mapping is where we work to identify the segments of our DNA with the ancestors we've inherited them from. I have videos that go more in depth on chromosome mapping, which I'll link in the description box below. Why is it necessary to employ chromosome mapping? Because the further back in time we go, the harder it becomes to identify the common ancestor between two people. Why? Because we all have thousands of ancestors. 
and each person you compare your DNA with has their own allotment of thousands of ancestors. Therefore, even genealogies that are well built out, there are inevitably branches of the tree that are not yet discovered, rendering it impossible to identify every single set of common ancestors you and a DNA match share in time. So when we build a chromosome map, we use numerous cousins we can verify with a paper trail to discover pileups on a specific segment that all the cousins descending from the most recent common ancestor have in relation to the base person, or the person whose chromosome map is being built. Each chromosome map is unique due to random inheritance. The segment pileups help us correctly identify descendants of a branch. However, most importantly, and most often overlooked, is that we have to account for random inheritance, meaning that not every descendant of a most recent common ancestor will possess the genetic markers on the same segment as everyone else. I cover this, what I've dubbed the right arm left arm analogy, in my video on random inheritance, which I'll link in the description box below. Please watch it as it will only benefit you and others. So what happens to the DNA and chromosome map when we have multiple sets of common ancestors? Well, a few things. Segments, demonstrated in the left arm right arm analogy, can merge together, increasing the shared centimorgans and make a DNA match appear closer than they really are. This is particularly difficult when working to solve an adoption case or non-paternal event. This is why it's good practice to examine everyone's branches very closely for common surnames and ancestors. We have recombination, again demonstrated in the left arm right arm analogy, where the segments with their similar markers will realign, meaning that this could be an ancestor that you descend from multiple times and the descending branches entwine, making this segment very prominent. We have terms such as generational collapse and bottlenecking where we have the same ancestors appearing along multiple branches of a person's tree. This occurs in everyone's tree at some point in history. The segments passed on from an apex ancestor in time can align and recombine and make these segments stand out. These prominent segments lend a hand to admixture, and this is discussed further in my other videos. We also have endogamy which is where multiple families live together in a community for multiple generations, and inevitably, we have second, third, fourth cousins, etc., begin intermarrying generation after generation, sometimes recognizing the similar surnames in their branches, other times not realizing they are distant relatives. I have a video on endogamy available as well. Endogamy can cause some major issues when working on adoption cases, non-paternal events, and chromosome mapping. So you have to be very aware of what you're working with, at least to the best of your knowledge. With all this said, we can understand why staying inside a default range benefits us, especially those just starting out who may not have a solid understanding of genetic genealogy or have their family tree well developed yet. And this really does comprise the majority of the consumer base. We all start somewhere and genealogy is a never ending journey. Enjoy it, but never stop improving your knowledge and methodology. Now, while there is still a lot more to unpack here, we're going to move forward for the sake of time. So when is it okay to lower the centimorgan threshold? First, you're going to want to have a firm understanding of the concepts we just discussed, period. There are a lot of variables and they cannot be ignored. Second, it is highly recommended that you first build out a chromosome map this will allow you to make sense of the segments, no matter what centimorgan threshold you're using. A chromosome map is a tool. Use it. You will only benefit from it. And when you're first building out a chromosome map, you really should use the standard centimorgan thresholds. Then you can apply the lower centimorgans. For projects dealing with ancestors roughly 10 to 15 generations back, maybe more, we can lower the centimorgan threshold but you need to use a chromosome map as a guide. This will verify the branch for the ancestor. Example, you shouldn't be identifying a segment for an ancestor on your paternal side of the family where the segment has otherwise been identified as coming to you via your paternal side of the family. That just doesn't track, unless your mother and father both have the same ancestor, in which case they are both descendants of that ancestor. But it stands to reason that if you lower the centimorgan threshold and identify a segment for an ancestor 10 to 15 generations back, 
That same segment should be a recurring segment identified at each generation between you and that ancestor. This is how we verify an ancestor in time with chromosome mapping. For an additional example, in the case of indigenous American ancestors with little to no paper trail, we can take a step further by including admixture into our chromosome map and taking note of the Mary Indian markers present. This can prove if an ancestor of Native American extraction was or was not present, where they are believed to have been in the family tree. If you have a Native American ancestor you are mapping for, but do not show Indian markers on the identified segment, then try mapping for a first, second, or even third cousin branch. Meaning use that cousin as the base person, rather than yourself. Build their chromosome map. It may be that your branch simply didn't inherit the Indian markers from that ancestor. Take a look at the video for my ancestor Mary Sweetwater, linked in the description box below. This video demonstrates the raw power of chromosome mapping with admixture. However, if you've mapped from many descendant branches and no one presents the Indian markers, you may wish to reconsider the lineage. I cannot stress enough the importance of understanding random inheritance. You cannot tell someone that they are not a descendant of an ancestor because they do not possess the segment or admixture the other descendants carry. We inherit approximately 50% DNA from each parent. 25% DNA from each grandparent, and only 12.5% DNA from each great-grandparent. And now we're going back 10 to 15 generations. Take a minute to appreciate how much DNA we are not inheriting from our ancestors. It's astounding. Now, let's talk about SNPs. SNP stands for Single Nucleotide Polymorphism, also known as mutations. SNPs are discussed more in-depth in my other videos. For a basic overview, when dealing with autosomal DNA, mutations happen at each generation. So if we have an apex ancestor, all descendants of that ancestor inherit different bits of their DNA. If we look at the children of that apex ancestor, each child's inherited DNA begins to mutate uniquely. From the immediate deviation from the apex ancestor, Unique markers are created and passed along to the next generation of each unique individual. Therefore, every generational step from the apex ancestor, a unique individual shares less and less mutations with the other descendants of that apex ancestor. Ergo, the more mutations, or SNPs, you share with a DNA match, the closer you are related. SNPs help us gauge the distance between the descendants of an apex ancestor as well as help understand how far back in time that ancestor might be. So just like the default centimorgan thresholds, the SNP default threshold is designed as a cutoff. Think higher and lower quality matches. The centimorgan and SNP default ranges complement one another. They are used in conjunction to present solid DNA matches to you within the close relative to fifth and seventh cousin range. So when we lower the SNPs, we're seeing more distantly in time. Again, think of everyone's unique allotment of thousands of ancestors. You need a lot of family tree data, and you need a lot of tools to make sense of the segments and their values. I urge you to use caution when deviating from default settings. They are there for a reason. For my own studies, I will lower the centimorgan threshold, but rarely do I lower the SNP threshold and I look very closely at the various branches for each participant in my DNA studies. There are so many variables. I hope this video has been helpful. Happy hunting, my friends.